Corn. It is the number one ingredient in a whole lot of different types of whiskey. And unfortunately, I think us as a community and an industry are often guilty of treating it like a commodity product rather than the special ingredient it should be. How's it going chasers? I'm Jesse and this is still at the channel all about chasing the craft of home distillation and making it a legitimate hobby. I know I'm guilty of just going down to the farm store and picking up feed grain, you know, feed corn and using that. But let's face it, we can do so much better than that, I think. So some people like the Brothers Licorice uh, over at Iron Root are selecting really special types of corn, heirloom varieties, um, like Bloody Butcher to use as a percentage of their grist to add something special to the flavor during the mash fermentation and then that sort of carries over into distillation as well. I don't have access to those specialty corns right now unless I grow them myself. So what I'm gonna do is take what I do have, which is malted corn, malted yellow corn from Gladfields, and I'm gonna mess around with it. See if we can make it something special. See if perhaps we could put some special flavors into the mash that'll carry over into distillation, you know, and make that final product a little more special than it could have been. Did you notice I said special a lot? <laughs> yep, we're making specialty corn. So a specialty malt, if you don't know guys, is basically a certain type of malt. Go to a homebrew store and uh, click on their specialty malt, you know, tab in the shop and you'll get, I don't know, you might get a hundred of the damn things. Different, all sorts of different crystal malts, chocolate malts, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of different things. So basically what I want to do is sort of steal the idea from beer brewers and move it over to corn to see if we can't make it work there. So James, one of the Patreons, got in touch with me and asked me if I'd looked into roasting corn. And that this is what triggered this whole thing off in my head, basically. So thank you, James. I appreciate it. So I'm going to show you how to roast corn in a couple of different ways. And to be honest, I think this would work whether or not it was malted. I don't know, I haven't tried it not malted. Uh, you should try that at home and let me know if it works as well. I see, no I see no reason why it wouldn't be exactly the same. We're gonna take four different sets of corn and we're gonna treat it in four different ways to try and target four different colors and four different flavor, sort of main flavor profiles for each of those. And then we're gonna do a little quick test to see, you know, what flavors we created. You're going to need three large oven pans and you're gonna to need to sprinkle a little bit of corn obviously into each of these pans. I'm not worried about the exact amount of corn, I'm worried about the depth of corn. I don't want a deep bed here. I want every kernel of corn to either touch the air above or the tray below. Fill all three pans to the same depth, pick out any little weird bits you find and it's off to the oven. Set your oven to 85 degrees Celsius or 185 degrees Fahrenheit and you're going to start popping the corn in. The trick here is to fit all this corn in the oven, <laughs> in one oven if you can, and get enough space in between each to get adequate airflow. I should have mentioned if you have fan bake, definitely use it. We're going to be cooking this for an hour though. You're going to want to pull it out and give it a stir, give it a, a toss if you will, at least twice during this duration. Bump the temperature to 110 degrees Celsius or 230 degrees Fahrenheit. Pop it all back into the oven for 30 minutes, at which point you're gonna pull your first product out. This first lot of corn, we're not really looking for a color change at all. In fact, it's going to be almost the same color, if not the same color as the corn that went into the oven. We just want a subtle change in taste for this one. While you're lusting over your new roasted corn, set your oven to 140 degrees centigrade or 285 degrees Fahrenheit. Pop the other two trays back in, when going for another 25 minutes. Obviously, as the oven gets hotter, you need to stir the corn, move the corn more often. Now, cook times are gonna vary based on your oven, but what you're looking for here is a slight reddening of the corn, a slight deepening in the color of the corn, then you know it's ready. Our last batch needs to go back into the oven one more time, and this time it's going for another half an hour at 165 degrees Celsius or 330 degrees Fahrenheit. With this last batch, you're looking for the color to go a little bit past red into the brown territory, but not too dark. We want to keep this one subtle still. This next part you could do on the kitchen stove, but if you value your life, probably do it outside on a gas burner or an induction burner with an old pan outside. Get that pan absolutely screaming hot, like you're going to cook a steak in it hot, and then we can put some corn in. Once again, we don't want to crowd the pan. Just fill it enough to cover the bottom of the pan, basically. As soon as the stuff touches the pan, you need to be stirring, and you don't stop for the next 25 minutes. 
This is about 12 minutes in guys and it's pretty much the same color as the last batch we took out of the oven. I'm going to take a little sample to test. Now obviously if you're, uh, if you're comfortable doing the old flippy doodah with the pan it's a whole lot easier than the spoon. By the 25 minute mark it's starting to look like this. Now to be honest I probably could have pushed this a little bit darker but it was dinner time. Now we have five different types of corn. We've got the control, the one we started with, the malted corn just by itself. We've got three different types of corn that we roasted in the oven. And of course we did the one right here, the darkest one that we did in the pan. Now I know I don't have to tell you guys that making a mash, you know, putting a certain percentage of each one into them, fermenting it out, putting it through a still, that's a huge time investment to be able to compare you know, one to the other and each against each other and all that sort of stuff to even see if there is a flavor contribution or difference. So what I want to do today is a cheeky little method that won't tell us whether or not flavor is going to carry over into the, you know, distilled product necessarily, but it should tell us pretty well whether or not uh, it's going to make a flavor contribution to the wash. And then at least we have a chance of that flavor carrying over to the final products. You know, if it doesn't make a flavor contribution to the wash, it's probably not going to do anything in the distillate. One quarter cup of corn goes into a pestle and mortar and we give it a good smashing. The idea here is not to completely pulverize everything, I just want to make sure that most of the kernels are cracked at least a couple of times, but haven't been crushed to dust. Next, pop them into a container, a waterproof container, with one cup of boiling water and leave for three minutes. Once your concoction steeped, use your preferred method to strain the liquid into a glass. Now rinse and repeat for the remaining corn samples. Here we are, we've got all the products lined up and ready to taste but before we do that I need to say a huge thank you to the Patreons, thank you so much guys. You know, I know the only reason I'm doing this at the moment and the only reason I can be putting out three videos a week is because of the Patreons, so thank you so much guys. If you do find value in these videos and you'd like to know how you can support uh, Still at Chase the Craft or the channel as well, you can jump on over to uh, chasethecraft.com slash support and uh, everything you can do can be found there. I am super happy with the color range that we've got out of this, if nothing else. The roasted one seems a little bit clearer, maybe the starch is more, I don't know, don't know why. That's a little bit strange to me, I don't know why it's done that. The difference between these four is stunning, it's exactly what I was hoping for and the aromas coming off them as I was mixing it were right down the, the the alley, right down the zone of where I was hoping these flavors would go. All right then, uh, let's give this stuff a taste, eh? Let's start with the control, the standard malted corn. When I say standard malted corn, please guys don't think that it is uh, normal or standard to use malted corn in a whiskey or a bourbon. I just mean it's what I've got here. In fact, most whiskies and bourbons are made with, you know, just dried corn, it's not malted in any way, so they need to boil it or um, gelatinize the, the starch in that corn in some way, shape or form. Because this stuff is uh, already malted, we don't need to gelatinize it, it's already gelatinized, but please, please, please don't fall into the trap of thinking it has enough diastatic power to convert itself, because it doesn't, you'll still need enzymes from somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> so it tastes like corn, but it doesn't taste like, um, doesn't taste like sweet corn at all. It tastes like, well actually, you know what? You know what it reminds me of is I, I can't remember, is it new season corn or late season corn? Uh, where the color sort of seems to drop right out of it and it goes kind of a, a pearly, almost translucent sort of white color and it develops or it has this flavor that is similar to ah, wet raw flour. Yeah, it's like raw, baker's flour, um, like a, a roux or a gravy or something that you've used flour and you haven't cooked it out properly, uh, or when you first start mixing flour and water together and give it a smell, it's, it's that kind of flavor. And it's not unpleasant, but it's just what it is. All right, let's move on to this one. Yeah, okay. This smells more, much more like sweet corn. It reminds me of sweet corn. Yep, the flavor's quite similar. So that raw floury taste is gone. It smells more like corn than it tastes. To be honest, that could be to do with the fact that, um, you know, I, I could have steeped this stuff longer, to be honest. Yeah, so, I mean, that's exactly what I was hoping this stage would do. It takes that um, raw as in uncooked, but raw also as in um, raw as in more um, unadulterated sort of flavor of the corn away, and it leads it much more towards corn, maybe like steamed sweet corn or something, without the, you know, the, the real big sweetness. <laughs> so different, <laughs> so different. 
<laughs> so uh, if you talk, if you're talking in brewing terms, they would call this toasty. It has that that smell of relatively light-ish bread out of the toaster. So it's not really de developing any sort of melanoidin colour to it, but it has that uh, it's been cooked and cooked quite well smell to it. And it really reminds me of something, man. It reminds me of something comforting and homey and man. So this, this just illustrates how, uh, especially scent, goes straight past all your filters in your brain and kind of into the emotional processing. So I cannot for the life of me right now think of what this smells like. But I can think of what I felt like when I smelt the same thing as this last time. It's crazy how your brain does that. Milo? No, not Milo. Uh, for those of you that, that don't know, Milo's a, a malt drink here in New Zealand. They kind of, um, we have it instead of hot cocoa, so you just put a couple of spoons into milk, hot milk, and stir it up. Horlicks. Horlicks, that's what it is. Dear God. <laughs> the flavor's pretty similar too. So we're developing these sort of melanoidin-ish flavors more, and obviously I'm thinking we're gonna hit those even more so soon. And the corn is still there, but it's starting to take a back seat to the flavor of the toasting itself, if that makes sense. And that is, that is really similar to the toasted smell I would get in you know any of the, the base malts or specialty malts that are gonna give you uh, a toasty flavor from you know a malted grain. All right, here we go. Whoa, okay, we've gone from toast to roast. <laughs> Similar sort of flavor, but deeper, darker, more grungy. And what I mean by roast, how do you describe it? Hmm. So imagine a really hearty whole grain bread and you cook it until the outside is, it's deep dark. Just as it sort of cooled down enough to pick it up, you pick it up and crackle it and give it a big deep smell. That's what, that's to me what roasty is. You've got none of the coffee or acrid chocolate sort of flavors coming through whatsoever. You know what this actually reminds me of? What this really reminds me of is, uh, is roast kumra. For those of you that uh, have, the, have had the joy of having roast kumra, really dark brown, almost burnt, you know, crunchy and crispy roast kumra, but not quite there. Uh, for those of you that haven't had kumra, um, I guess sweet potato, but it's so much better than that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, moving on to the last one. <laughs> yeah, it smells almost coffee-ish. Oh, that's so cool. Whoa, but the corn's back. That, okay, that and, which one was it? No, not that. That. Yes. <laughs> okay, so the, uh, the sweet corn flavor with the burnt corn flavor, you know, like almost burnt, but not quite burnt. This reminds me of uh, sweet corn off the grill. We've we got some of it grilled to perfection and it's just kind of... Uh, it's, it's cooked and it's yellow, but it's still not mushy and smushy on the inside. And then you've got other bits that are like totally charred with, you know, big black streaks running down it, grill marks on it and that sort of stuff. A little whiff of that, with a whole lot of that. <laughs> That's cool, I dig that. Okay, so it tastes much more like coffee than it smells. It smells like, it smells like charred corn, but it tastes more coffee-ish. Wow, okay. So I don't know guys, I am, uh, I'm really happy with this, I really am. I'm gonna leave it up to you guys to throw some ideas out there in terms of what ratios you would use of, you know, which with what and what you'd mix together and how you'd use it. So I wanted to throw this out there, I thought it would be a cool way to test it out real quickly and uh, get some, you know, get a basic idea of what it could do to a wash and what it could and what flavors could carry over into a distilled product. So thanks a bunch to James for sort of uh, kicking me into action on this one. Pretty cool, dude. I'm, I'm happy with this. <laughs> I'm really hoping that you guys go away and give this stuff a go. I would love to see what you come up with in terms of what you're gonna put into products. I'd love to see what other ideas you've got in terms of how you could treat this stuff, you know, to make a wider range of specialty products. I think that'd be really, really fun. So uh, get amongst it, guys. Go and give it a go. Just to let you know too, I set up regular live streams on every second weekend, uh, unfortunately, the second one that's come up is falling on Mother's Day. So I'm gonna take that day off, gonna hang out with the family, uh, spoil the wife a little bit. Excuse me, <laughs> we'll get stuck into it the week after, all right? If you enjoyed this video, please guys, give me a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. Share it around to anyone else that you think might enjoy content like this. You know what? I'd like to know what the beer brewers would think of this. I'd like to know what beer brewers could do with this. Anyway, it's been a blast. Thanks heaps, guys. Keep on chasing the craft. I'll see you next time. See ya.